Welcome to another edition of Horse Center, everyone. I am Brian Zipsy, and as always, I have the terrific pleasure of being joined by my co-host to the East Coast. That's Matt Schiffman. How are you today, Matt? I am good, Brian. We're ready for the second jewel of the Triple Crown in Baltimore. On to Pimlico for the Preakness. Matt, last week we were a little worried that we wouldn't have any of the top names challenging the impressive unbeaten Kentucky Derby winner justifying the Preakness. But Chad Brown, E5 Racing and Stone Street Stables say no, we are going to run good magic. The Kentucky Derby runner-up, the Breeders' Cup juvenile winner, the two-year-old champion, good magic in the Preakness. And Matt, I think that's nothing but good news. It is good news. It looks like we're going to have a field of eight that is made up of four horses from the Derby and four Preakness new shooters. Oh, there's that new shooter thing again. <laughs> hey, Matt, uh, if you don't mind, let's run down the field real quick. I made my own morning line, as I always do for these big races. I have Justify it one to two, Matt. Good Magic, three to one. No one else is under 10 to one, and there's only one horse at 10 to one. That's Quip. Bravazo, Lone Sailor, tenfold at 20 to one. And then we drop down to Sporting Chance and Diamond King at 30 to one. So my question to you is, Justify one to two, is he worth that kind of low odds? Well, Brian, I don't, I don't know. Is any horse worth those kind of odds when it comes to uh, when it comes to betting strategy? But I, I think that's, I think your morning line is pretty realistic. I thought Justify might be somewhere between two to five and three to five, which is uh, exactly as you have it. When you go back and look at the past performances of his trainer Bob Baffert. I guess maybe it's not such a bad price considering that Mr. Baffert has never lost the Preakness with one of his Kentucky Derby winners. Justify is four for four lifetime. Baffert's four for four lifetime in the Preakness after winning the Derby. He's won six Preaknesses total, Matt. Uh, Obviously, Justify is in good hands and just appears to be doing very well. Or That's everything we're hearing out of the Baffert camp, Baffert was out at Churchill Downs to see the star running, and he liked what he saw. Apparently, any issues with that hoof, whether it were the scratches or the heel bruise, looks like Justify is back to fit as a fiddle, and uh, Baffert is happy just like he was before the Kentucky Derby. And speaking of the clear second choice, the, uh, the uh, Derby runner-up, Obviously, Matt, I think if if Chad Brown is choosing to run good magic on two weeks rest in the Preakness, it, it says a lot about how this horse continues to thrive this spring. We saw how happy Brown was after the bluegrass, knowing his horse was doing so well. He, he did nothing but well at Churchill Downs. He's already out at Pimlico, a sloppy Pimlico track uh, this morning, galloping, getting a feel for the track. But obviously, Brown must be tickled pink with how good magic has come out of the Kentucky Derby. Otherwise, he doesn't run them. Yeah, I think that's true. And then just jumping back to to, uh, uh, justify for a minute. I mean, I think I think when you brought up those uh, heel problems and all the different stories that we heard about it, I think it's only fair that we bring that up and mention it to uh, mention it to the fans, because, I mean, it's certainly that. That little bit of a question mark is lingering in the back of my head, especially when the gates open and they get into heated competition again. um, You know, going going to good magic. I agree with what you said about Chad Brown. I don't think he's interested. I don't think that he feels like the mile and a half in the Belmont Stakes is a particularly good fit for good magic. And since he is doing well, why not take another shot at the Triple Crown uh, right now in the Preakness? Right, and, and and I think it's a good thing for racing to have a big challenger for Justify. I'm a little surprised that Curlin, son of Curlin out of a hard spun, stakes winning hard spun mare that uh, Brown's not high in good magic going 12 furlongs, but hey, he knows a lot more about good magic and training horses than I do, so I'll defer to him, and certainly good magic is uh, the horse who looks uh, like the best challenger for Justify and here, Matt, but there are other horses. Uh, Quip, uh, I, I like the decision, I, I said this before the Derby, not to run 
uh, in the Kentucky Derby to wait for the Preakness. Obviously, this horse is developing for the former assistant to Belmont, uh, and, and he seems to be doing really well. He, I, I think he's going to be the clear uh, third choice off those wins in the Tampa Bay Derby, and I should say a win in the Tampa Bay Derby and a second place in the Arkansas Derby. A couple others that interest me, Bravazo, a friend reminded me uh, how far he ran in the Derby. He had one of the longest trips around the track that day at Churchill Downs, so his sixth place finish was even better than it looks. And awesome again, Lucas, uh, we've seen this story before with Oxbow running a decent Derby and then putting it all together for the Preakness. Uh, and then I'm, I'm intrigued by Tenfold, a horse who's uh, lightly raced, but I think uh, probably a horse who could develop into something very good. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Brian. And, and as the fans should know, uh, when it comes to uh, the Preakness, it usually is the Derby horses that that take most of the the betting money. They take the bulk of the action as they uh as they well should. I mean, to me, it seems like Quip is a horse that seems to be getting ignored a little bit and and has done very little wrong in his career. Um, I also like Tenfold. Steve Asmussen is high on the horse. Let's uh, let me talk a little bit more about him. Uh, he won his first two races at Oaklawn in the late winter, and then in the Arkansas Derby, he ran fifth. Asmussen has said that he or the horse has been doing extremely well since the Arkansas Derby. I think he's a horse that is de- that has a lot of talent. His early races were impressive, had good speed figures. This is a horse that could be in, improving and maybe is one of the new shooters that can uh, that can finish in the money. Bravazzo certainly outran his odds of sixty nine to one in the uh in the derby when he rallied to get sixth place right matt and and in fact with bravazo if you look at that derby and you look at the uh the the feet run during the race uh it was a very good performance and you throw out that louisiana derby for whatever reason he didn't run in the louisiana derby you've got a very interesting horse so i i'm with you there bravazo and tenfold are my two long shots tenfolds only run three times Folks, I know I've said that before, before the Kentucky Derby with the eventual Kentucky Derby winner, but I still think this is a tough jump up for Tenfold. But I'm with Matt. Uh, in fact, I said this uh, a few weeks ago. I think Tenfold is a horse that uh, will develop into a nice horse. The ones we haven't mentioned too much yet, Lone Sailor ran a decent enough Derby, uh, eighth place. I'm not sure I like him as much in the Preakness. Originally, I thought there might be more speed in here, Matt. It doesn't look as speedy as it did uh, as as it did possibly a week ago, uh, Sporting Chance I think just has too many things uh, to overcome uh, with himself. Basically, he's a horse who uh, who makes trouble for himself, and and he's got some talent, but uh, hard to see him putting it all together for the Preakness. And Diamond King I think is just a, a nice horse, uh, Parks uh, based, uh, kind of a mid Atlantic horse there, but probably just a cut below. So for me in my betting, I will be using Bravazo and Tenfold a little bit with the favorites and uh, see if we can't get something done. But Matt, I can't get away from Justify as my top pick and Good Magic as my second pick. Yeah, that's uh, that's uh, that's all very logical, uh, uh, Brian. Um, and like you said, Diamond King's a nice horse. Hey, he's won four races in his six starts, but as you said, most of them were, they were all in the mid-Atlantic region. Uh, uh, You know, he was mentioned a few times uh, for starts on the Derby Trail at Aqueduct, but they always opted to go back and run um, at Laurel. And and in his victory, his his speed figures are just just a notch below um, what the Derby horses have done. And, and sporting chance is, you know, is just a horse that seems to be a head case right now. Even in, uh, even since the Derby uh, the other day, he was scheduled to uh, have a final breeze, and they took him to the track. And uh, several times he refused to kick it into high gear there. So um, I, I can't feel real confident about uh, sporting chance. I'm with you, Matt. That's the Preakness Field, folks. Uh, justify deserving favorite unbeaten Kentucky Derby winner. Will we be talking triple crown at this time next week? We very well may be. 
Good Magic, two-year-old champion, ran a very good race in the Kentucky Derby to be second, offers a big challenge again in the Preakness. And then Matt and I are both saying Quip, Bravazo, and Tenfold as horses to possibly uh, get in the mix a little bit as Preakness long shots. Matt, after 37 years, American Pharaoh for trainer Bob Baffert finally broke through. He became the first horse in nearly four decades to add his name to the roll call of champions of Triple Crown winners, horses to sweep the Kentucky Derby Preakness and Belmont Stakes. So that means uh, a few years later, uh, it's been 40 years since the second to last Triple Crown winner did it. 12 horses. Could we have 13 this year? Is it too early to start talking about Justify as a possible Triple Crown winner? I don't think it's too early to start talking about that. I think you and I both feel that that Justify is a very likely winner of the of the Preakness, and that would send him on his way uh, to be a contender for the Triple Crown. And, you know, in the past, back in the 70s, uh, after a long drought, there there was a cluster of uh, Triple Crown winners when we went from Secretariat uh, uh to Seattle Slough to affirm. So why not have another cluster now? But we also have to remember that it is no easy task to uh, complete the Triple Crown. In that 37-year gap, there were a lot of horses that went to uh, Belmont Park uh, with a chance to win the Triple Crown. And we talked about Bob Baffert and his uh, perfect record from Derby to Preakness in winning that. And so what does that mean? It means he headed to uh, Belmont Park with a chance to win the Triple Crown in all those instances. But even him, even he was only to do it, able to do it once with American Pharaoh. So even if Justify takes this Preakness like you and I think, Brian, um, history, uh, history makes it tough to complete the, the three jewels. Absolutely, Matt. We're looking back at history here, folks. Sir Barton was a maiden back in 1919 before he swept the series, before it was really known as the Triple Crown. Gallon Fox, and then five years later, his son Omaha, 1930, 1935, became the second and third Triple Crown winners. The highly regarded War Admiral, the horse that many of us know from the famous match race, losing that match race to Seabiscuit, did it in 1937. Mr. Longtail, Matt, 1941 whirl away with his big come from behind style was able to easily sweep the triple crown as did two other horses in the or three other horses in the 40s but count fleet in 43 and uh citation in 1948 were dominant winners of the crit triple crown assault also got it done in 1946. matt we had a 25 year gap before secretary came along he of the big red the big heart and his rival sham the Belmont was incredible with a 31 length win after setting suicidal fractions with Sham early in that Belmont. Seattle Slough, 1977, I'm going to talk about him more in a second, became the second Triple Crown winner in a few years when he did it in 77 and then affirmed and his great rival, Alidor, 1978. They ran one, two in each leg, none closer than the last leg, the Belmont Stakes. But Matt, 1977, Back then, Seattle Slough was a little bit lightly raced for his Triple Crown, but he is the only undefeated horse, the only horse to go through the Triple Crown undefeated. That's what Justify is looking to do here. Matt, he's got speed, he's got talent. We've known it from the beginning, and now we know he's ready to do it at classic distances against top competition. The Preakness is easier than the Derby. We might have a wet track again like the Derby. Good Magic is a good horse, but... I, too, like you, am feeling that Justify will at least get to Belmont with the chance. I I think I agree with that, Brian. And, and as we know, one thing that has changed in terms of uh, winning the Triple Crown is that uh, a lot of people, a lot of trainers now are skipping the Preakness and they head to the Belmont with fresh horses. So uh, um, it makes the task maybe a little bit harder for Justify than for some of those others that you mentioned where that strategy didn't quite come into play 
uh, as it does today. That's right. And, and we don't need to look at new shooters. We only need to look at Kentucky Derby horses. How about Audible? My boy, Jack Hoffberg, Vino Rosso. That's, that's four horses waiting, skipping the Preakness and waiting for the Belmont. Horses that very well may like a mile and a half at Belmont Park. So justify, if we're right, if most people are right, if just about everybody's right, justify does indeed win the Preakness. The Belmont will be no easy task, but if he does it, he'll become Bob Baffert's second Triple Crown winner and the 13th horse in history to win the Triple Crown. Matt, in between the Kentucky Derby and the Preakness, there was a pretty nice day out at Belmont Park. Belmont Park recently opened for the 2018 racing season, and I believe you were there, sir, for a really nice card on Saturday. I, I was, Brian. Made my first appearance at beautiful Belmont Park for the spring-summer meeting. There were there was a great uh, uh, lineup of stakes races, graded stakes races, on the dirt and on the turf. On the dirt and on the turf. Let's start with the turf first, Matt. The grade one man of war. This used to be a big race in the fall. Now it's a pretty big race in late spring. And we had a first time winner of a grade one race in America, though, Matt, because High Happy was a big thing down in Argentina before he came to the States. Struggled just a little bit out in California in, in his first year here. But since moving to Todd Pletcher's barn and specifically, going a distance on the turf. This horse looks like the real deal. Eight of 13 now, lifetime. Yeah, Brian, and people think that Todd Pletcher uh, is only a dirt trainer. Like you said, he he really didn't run particularly well out in California. He got switched to Todd's barn um, and now has made three starts for Todd. Um, before the Man of War, he won a, a grade two at Gulfstream Park and in an impressive fashion. And very often horses that win at Gulfstream on that dirt, the sandy, dirty grass uh, surface at Gulfstream doesn't always translate well to uh, other turf courses like Belmont Park, where the grass is, is deep and thick and plush, but made no difference to High Happy. Um, he, ran, uh, he ran a really big race in there. In the Man of War for that grade one win in America. This is a six-year-old son of pure prize. He's all racehorse, Matt, and he can go long for sure. A horse we need to keep an eye on as we get closer to the Breeders' Cup turf, of course, a mile and a half at Churchill Downs later in November. Sadler's Joy, a horse I enjoy watching, really did kick it in late. There wasn't a lot of pace. High Happy uh, stalked and kicked like a good thing, but uh, we, we should ma make mention of Sadler's Joy because uh, off that pretty slow pace uh, on a turf course that did have some moisture, uh, Sadler's Joy also came running for second. Yeah, uh, a High Happy was just too good for him. Okay, another another horse who kicked it in late, and, and I wondered if he was going to get there for a while, but he really just powered by in the stretch perhaps helped by uh, several of the favorites kind of keeping each other company in the Peter Pan, was Blended Citizen. Matt, I'll remind you that Blended Citizen was an $85,000 two-year-old in training purchase down in Ocala last year. Now trained by Doug O'Neill, he's won two of his last three, the Jeff Ruby stakes on a synthetic surface at Turfway. But this Belmont win, the Peter Pan, was his best race yet. Yeah, for sure. And, and this is a horse that is extremely versatile this is a horse that broke his maiden in california on the turf and then got that stakes win um at turfway park on the artificial surface which got him some derby points and folks remember that blended citizen was number 21 the also eligible and didn't get into the derby field so doug o'neill said hey what the heck let's go up to belmont park and try the dirt um in a one turn mile in an eighth race. And, uh, and he ran big and I agree with you, Brian, watching that race and then watching the replay again, uh, coming down the stretch, it, it, it looked like uh, blended citizen was just kind of spinning his wheels. But, uh, as they got to the 16th pole, he really kicked it in and, and got rolling and drew away from this field, uh, um, very nicely. And, and out of that race, 
showing his liking to Big Sandy in New York. Uh, Doug O'Neill said that uh, he's going to stay in New York and prepare for the Belmont Stakes. So that's just another one who would uh, who will be waiting for Justify if he wins the Preakness. Absolutely. The stakes will get higher for the Jeff Ruby Stakes winner, Matt. But the son of Proud Citizen looked good winning the Peter Pan on Saturday. Let's switch back to the green stuff, Matt, the turf, because I think there was another big performance also from a uh, import, Matt. This one was from the familiar team of Chad Brown and Michael Dubb. Now, a raving beauty was no, by no means a superstar over in Europe, but it, it seemed like her form was really getting better and better. Uh, last seen finishing second in a Group 1 race in Italy last year. Her U.S. debut had happened in the Bogue, also Saturday at Belmont Park. The gray five-year-old daughter of Master Craftsman Matt could not have looked much better in winning on Saturday. I agree with that, Brian. And this is a thing that uh, is happening with the Chad Brown barn. Uh, a Raving Beauty is owned by Michael Dubb and Head of Plains uh, uh, Partners. And they've got people looking around in Europe and they bring these turf horses over. Um, they usually get Lasix for the first time, as Raving Beauty did, and they go to Chad Brown, and uh, he does some pretty darn good things with them. Um, it was a small field, but in that small field, Brian was a horse that you and I talked a lot about uh, last year. That was Inflexibility, who did some really, really good things, got some really big wins up in Canada uh, um, against some good horses. So uh, coming down the stretch... Uh, Raving Beauty took the lead and was very impressive and drew away from that very nice horse in flexibility. Yeah, a Raving Beauty. Now, she might have been helped a little bit. I, I mentioned there was uh, some moisture in the turf course on Saturday at Belmont, but uh, uh, certainly this was uh, a very big performance. I was uh, really uh, uh, thrilled with the performance. Sister Charlie uh, showed out here at Keeneland, also an import for Chad Brown throwing a raving beauty as another one to watch on those uh, distaff turf side of things for Mr. Chad Brown, Michael Dubb, head of planes, a raving beauty, a Philly to watch as we move forward. Hey, Matt, those were some of the big graded stakes performers at Belmont Park. But I think the biggest story of the day there was actually in an allowance race. It was the sixth race. And we had the return of a real fan favorite, son of Union Rags named Patch Matt. Will you remind me why he's named Patch? Yeah, Brian. And, and he really is. It's amazing what a fan favorite he is. And, of course, uh, he's named Patch because he lost one of his eyes. Uh, um when, when he was a younger horse, he lost his left eye, which means when he's racing, he can't see to the inside, horses to the inside. And Matt, you know, I don't want to spread misinformation. I believe Patch actually had the name before he lost the eye. I think it's something along the Union Rags uh, line, but it, it's kind of ironic that Patch uh, only has one eye. And Matt, you were there for his return. Uh, most people didn't think he was going to get up there at the eighth pole, but he just kept coming. He sure did, Brian. And, and you know, talking a little bit more about Patch, it was his second career win. Uh, in addition to that, remember last year he was second in the Louisiana Derby and he was third in the Belmont Stakes. So even though he's only got two wins, he's got a pretty good stakes record. He's won uh, almost $500,000. Um, after the race, uh, Todd Pletcher, his trainer, uh, um, like everybody else, was talking about how Patch is such a neat horse. Um, and, and he's an interesting horse because he doesn't really like to train. He's not an enthusiastic horse in the morning, but in the barn, he's a, he's a real sweet horse and everybody loves him. But when he gets on the racetrack, uh, Pletcher described him as a as a horse that is full of heart and determination, um, and and he said he'd love for some of his uh, uh, more high priced horses to have that those kind of features that Pat shows on the racetrack. And and you're right, Brian. It didn't look like he was going to get there, but he dug in on the on the far outside and and just went by the rest of that field. So 
He still has allowance conditions left, and obviously there are stakes races ahead. But boy, is he popular. After the race, I posted a winner circle picture of Patch, and and it was a very popular post on Twitter. Uh, hundreds and hundreds of likes and retweet, retweets, and even uh, four, five, six days after the race, it's still getting attention. So uh, racing fans love Patch, and there's nothing wrong with that. And that's why we're talking about patch here, Matt. This is the this is the patch segment part of the show. And you know, we we still don't know how good patch may be. Uh, I don't think he's the most talented horse, and obviously Todd Fletcher doesn't feel as he's the most talented horse in his barn. Uh, but you look at his record. You know, he rallied for second his first time out, rallied to win a maiden race. Kentucky Derby uh, was his fourth lifetime race after a very good Louisiana Derby, which he rallied for second, as you mentioned. Kentucky Derby, he just got pinballed around, bounced around, and uh, had to be a little bit of a nightmare for him. But then came back in the Belmont, rallied for third. And then the West Virginia Derby after a break where horses kind of stayed where they were early in the race, he, he, he still tried and rallied for fourth. Obviously a horse who tries very hard, as you alluded to. And uh, after a long layoff, it was nice to see him win. Yeah, he still got allowance conditions available to him as uh, uh, this was his first win other than that maiden win. Uh, but uh, they were all graded stakes after that maiden win until this one. And uh, my guess is we see more graded stakes uh, in his future. And having seen what he did in Louisiana and the Belmont stakes and then in his return race, four-year-old son of Union Rags, Matt, I think he's a, a viable graded stakes a performer this year in, in an older division, not particularly strong, especially when we're looking at horses going maybe nine, 10 furlongs. Yeah. And there are a lot of opportunities around the country for, uh, for those older horses, but I don't know. It seems like a uh, track like Belmont park and, and even Saratoga that are, that are bigger than the miles maybe are tracks that, uh, that suit patch really well and suit, you know, the fact that he has a, uh, a, uh, only has one uh, one eye and limited vision. That's right. And, and, and what do Belmont Park and Fairgrounds have in common is a long stretch as well. So yeah, Pat should be happy at Belmont. Saratoga, I agree with you. Hey, maybe he's a Jockey Club Gold Cup horse down the road. But uh, like you all folks, Horse Center here, Matt and I, are rooting for Patch to keep on doing well. And uh, four-year-old season got off to a great start. Hey, Matt, I want to thank our sponsor, Derby Wars, the best contest site out there. I also urge you, uh, all you fans out there watching, to subscribe to our YouTube channel if you haven't already done so right here on Horse Racing Nation. And Matt and I, you, you probably know a little bit about our new venture, Derby Day Racing, derbydayracing.com. Two-year-old partnership is, uh, is uh, moving forward, but we do have a nice event June 2, Matt. It's a meet and greet out at the Buff Bradley Barn. Matt, I hope you can be there with, with us because we're going to meet a lot of people that are potentially interested in joining the team. It should be a terrific time on the back stretch at Churchill Downs. June 2, the morning of June 2, Matt, and that'll be, uh, yeah, we'll watch horses work and we'll spend time with Buff Bradley and uh, you can meet the Derby Day Racing team right there at Churchill Downs. So that'll be fun. Matt, uh, as always, it's been another enjoyable show to, to do with you. Do you have a closing shot for me, my friend? I want to wish everybody good luck in the Preakness. Think about using maybe some of those new shooters. Uh, I've got an article on Horse Racing Nation for you to take a look at in terms of betting with the new shooters. And, of course, as always, I want to thank Brett Workman for putting our show together. Thank you to Brett, and thank you, folks, sincerely. We appreciate you watching each and every week. We'll be back with the post Preakness show next week right here on Horse Center. Hey, as we leave you, Matt, uh, folks, let's let's give a little bit of, uh, 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 of a celebratory nod to that Canadian Horse of the Year, Pink Lloyd. Pink Lloyd left his competition comfortably numb, Matt, if you will. <laughs> this is his 10th straight win. Not only is it 10 straight wins, Matt, but it's his 10th straight stakes win, and they've all come at Woodbine. Here's Pink Lloyd winning the New Providence at Woodbine. Pink Lloyd now, and they turn in the New Providence, and Pink Lloyd in front, one and a half, looking for purse money on the outside, trying to make a race of this. 
Pink Lloyd has other ideas, and just like Water Off a Duck's Back is just rolling so smoothly. And again, we're going to see another stakes win. Day 10 at the meet, a 10th stakes win in succession. Just gets so easy. Pink Lloyd could not have won with more in reserve. One by five, looking for purse money second. Good old hockey game third. Martin River was fourth.